This is a Dynamic Network podcast. Hi, welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And in this episode, we are doing a spooktacular duel between two witch characters, Clarion the Witch Boy from DC and Agatha Harkness from Marvel, who currently, of course, has her own series on Disney Plus, Agatha All Along. Yeah, I haven't started watching it yet. I'm hoping to binge it right before Halloween because it feels very Halloween-y and I I don't want to wait week to week, basically. Well, hopefully this episode will help people get in the Halloween spirit. But before we get into the duel, we're going to break down the comic book movie news from the past week, of which there's really just one news item, and that was that Aaron Pierre has been cast as Jon Stewart in the Green Lantern series. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description, so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. Guys, our artificially intelligent dual simulator, AJ9K, has a quick message for our listeners, so listen up. Why, hello there. Do you want even more from this podcast? Then become a part of the Dynamic Dual community on Patreon, where you can choose from three tiers. The Dynamic 2.0 tier gives you access to our Discord chat server. The Fantastic 4 tier gives you two bonus episodes each month. And the X-Force tier makes you an executive producer of this show. Lastly, the Dynamite Podcast Network tier lets you create your own podcast using this Monte Carlo simulator. Johnny and Joe will help you develop your show, provide graphic support and consultation, and get you simulation results. Pitch the twins your ideas via email at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. Check it out at patreon.com slash dynamic duel. Pip pip cheerio. Thanks, AJ9K, and thanks to everyone who supports the podcast. Guys, be sure to tune into the other shows on the Dynamic Podcast Network this week, including Max Destruction, which pits your favorite action heroes from film and television against each other. This week, hosts Scotty and Gilly are reviewing Beetlejuice for Spooktober. On the Sandra World podcast, host Zachary Hepburn speculates on fights between fan-favorite anime and manga characters. He did not release an episode last week due to being sick, so the Muzan from Demon Slayer and Femto from Berserk episode will be this Thursday. And on the Console Combat podcast, hosts John and Dean simulate battles between popular video game characters. In yesterday's episode, they reviewed Five Nights at Freddy's. Visit dynamicpodcasts.com or click the link in our show notes to listen to all of the shows in the Dynamic Podcast Network. But with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award we post on Instagram for the person that we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week, we asked you guys, who's your favorite Robin character from the comics and why? We got a lot of answers, eight in total, but only three got an honorable mention, and there was one no prize winner. So let's go ahead and run those down. Our first honorable mention goes to Mason Thompson, who said, What's up? So obviously, got to go fan favorite Jaro, but I know that's a little obscure, so I'll pull from the main selection. I'm going to go with Jason. You know, he went from people wanting to vote him to get killed off to him coming back, and he's popular in the main media and he's a fan favorite i mean that's just an insane comeback to not choose him he has so much depth to him and feel just with bruce and his connection so yeah give me jason as the best robin yeah jason todd has one of the most interesting backstories of a comic book character ever fans initially hated him like mason said they voted for the character to die decades ago although that wasn't really true Yeah, actually, one guy used a speed dialer to vote way more times than anyone else. So it was kind of rigged. But, you know, for the character to come back and be arguably the coolest Robin as Red Hood is quite the character arc. Yeah, he had a lot of attitude as a Robin, which I think a lot of people didn't like. But it makes sense to parlay that attitude into more of a badass character in the Bat family. And he has a really cool look to him, too. So, yeah, absolutely. Of course, if you want to learn more about Jason Todd, we pit him in one of our dual episodes against the Punisher. Great answer, Mason. Our next honorable mention goes to Travis Herndon, who said, 
What's up, Dynamic Dudes? Travis here. Shout out to my evil twin. So my pick would have to be Duke Thomas. Now, I know he wasn't exactly chosen by Bruce to be the new Robin. It was Alfred, but Alfred is Bruce's second in command. And I think Duke is pretty cool Robin at the time and very underrated compared to like all the rest of the other Bat family. So yeah, my answer would be Duke Thomas. That's my favorite Robin. Yeah, Duke Thomas was a character who came around during a time when Batman Bruce Wayne was dead, but he quickly emerged as a pretty popular teenage hero within Gotham. Of course, he was never officially a Robin, but he is still a part of the Bat family as the character of Signal, Gotham's daytime protector, considering that Duke Thomas is a metahuman with powers. What kind of powers? Uh, It involves light. I forget the exact name of it, but he could essentially see the past Uh, sort of almost like in a photographic way. Like if he looks into a room through the light, he can see what had transpired there earlier. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it it is really cool. Great answer, Travis Herndon. Our next honorable mention goes to Gavin Carrasco, who said... Hello, this is Gavin, first time responder. Um, I'm coming with the hot take of Kara Kelly from The Dark Knight Returns. I always thought she was the best of Dick Grayson with his wit and charm. And I always thought she was smart like Tim Drake. And those are two of the best Robins. So them combined had a really good Robin for an amazing Batman. So that's my answer. Kara Kelly from Dark Knight Returns. Yeah, I still remember the first time I read The Dark Knight Returns and how cool the character of Carrie Kelly was as a Robin. She, of course, was the very first female Robin, you know, outside of DC's standard continuity. And she did a fantastic job. Fan favorite, totally a favorite of mine for sure. So great answer, Gavin. Was she Robin chronologically before Stephanie Brown was? Because I know Spoiler has been a Robin as well. Well, Spoiler wasn't a Robin until I think the 2000s. Oh, so chronologically, it's hard to say because The Dark Knight Returns takes place in the future. But from a publishing standpoint, yeah, Carrie Kelly was the first Robin. She wasn't Robin for long. She moved on to being Catgirl by the sequel to that story. But yeah, she still made it for a cool Robin. Great answer, Gavin. We want to give a quick shout out to Cyrus Moore, Daniel Alonso. Uh, Daniel, you gave the best answer. Basically, his answer was, who cares? It's Robin. And <laughs> as a Marvel fan, I just loved that. Uh Shout out to Mike Williams and Peter Troll for calling in with your answers. Thanks for taking the time to do that. But the winner of this week's No Prize is Miggy Matagian, who said, Hey, what's up, guys? It's Miggy, and my favorite Robin is the OG, the best Robin, Dick Grayson. He's the paragon of everything DC represents. He overcame great tragedy to selflessly champion hope and compassion to a world without those in and out of the costume and grew into a respected figure in universe. He led teams like the Titans and the Outsiders to bring about justice and even led the entire superhero community through several world shattering events like Dark Crisis, Beast World, and Absolute Power. And he's just really damn cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I know of no bigger Nightwing Dick Grayson fan than our executive producer, Miggy Mathingian. I agree Dick Grayson is the best Robin for all of the reasons that Miggy just stated. He is one of the most interesting and probably one of the most important characters in the entirety of DC Comics. Someone who represents the hope and compassion of Superman, but with all of the ability and expertise of Batman, he's just a fantastic character. Yeah, if you're a member of our Discord channel, you know how much Mickey loves Dick. He loves Damn! Dick a lot, uh, maybe <laughs> too much, Jeez. some might say, because the character is just so, so I only see him as the character who lost to Daredevil in the duel that we had between those two characters. Oh, wow, look, a Marvel fan with the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer, Miggy. Proud of you, Miggy. You win this week's no prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own no prize, stay tuned until later on in this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. But with that out of the way, on to the news. Okay, so a few weeks ago, we learned that Kyle Chandler was cast as Hal Jordan in the upcoming Lantern series for HBO that's going to be a part of James Gunn's new DC Cinematic Universe. Now, the series supposedly has two leads, Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart, and we've been waiting to see who is going to be cast as Jon Stewart, this iconic Green Lantern character. And it looks like James Gunn has gone with Aaron Pierre from the Netflix movie Rebel Ridge, which I have not seen, but I hear is good. It's really hard to be excited about this casting because I have not seen that yet. 
I haven't seen it either, but apparently it's pretty popular on Netflix. Yeah, and a lot of people are praising his performance in it. I know he has a ton of upcoming work, including The Lion King. He's doing voice work for Mufasa. He's also playing Malcolm X in the Nat Geo series MLK slash X. The guy is definitely going to be a star, especially with this series. I think the craziest thing about him is that I, I think he has green eyes or blue eyes or something like that. They're very piercing in a way that the comic book character Jon Stewart also has. Yeah, yeah. Jon Stewart has green eyes in the comics uh, when he has his Green Lantern ring on. But it's like they don't even need to do CGI for Aaron Pierre's eyes because, yeah, those things are really bright, really striking. I wonder if that's one of the reasons he was chosen. Well, that, I mean, you know, he has a strong military look to him. I believe him as, you know, this ex-military guy. If you guys want to learn more about the comic book character of Jon Stewart, check out his dual episode we did against Quasar. Yeah, that was a fun episode. Jon Stewart is my favorite Green Lantern, so I'm pretty excited for this casting, even though I'm not too familiar with the actor. I'm more excited for this casting, actually, than I was of hearing that Kyle Chandler was playing Cal Jordan. I wonder how the two will do chemistry-wise. I know that... All the actors in final contention for the role of John Stewart had to do a chemistry reading with Kyle Chandler. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's great to hear. Well, if they chose Aaron Pierre, then, you know, I'm sure the chemistry was fantastic. I'm actually really curious to see what the dynamic will be between the two. I'm assuming Kyle Chandler's Hal Jordan will be training Aaron Pierre's John Stewart, but we'll see if that's the case. The Lantern Show has a phenomenal crew behind the scenes, including writers Chris Mundy and Damon Lindelof. I expect really good things from this show. And speaking of great superhero shows, that brings us to our question of the week. What has been your favorite live action Marvel or DC television series so far and why? There have been quite a few to come out now and pretty much across the whole spectrum of really, really good to not so good. So I'm curious to hear what your favorite is. Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message could be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and award that person a Dynamic Duel No Prize that we'll post to Instagram. Be sure to answer before October 19th. But that does it for all the news for this episode. So now let's go ahead and move on to our main event, where we pit in a duel the two witch characters of Clarion the Witch Boy and Agatha Harkness. Okay, Clarion the Witch Boy versus Agatha Harkness. Of course, we wanted to do a tie-in duel to Agatha Harkness because we knew that she was going to be having her television series, Agatha All Along, currently airing on Disney Plus during the Halloween season, so it seemed very appropriate to do a witch duel. Now, us and the executive producers had a hard time finding a match for Agatha. Initially, we had voted that we wanted to pit her up against Madame Xanadu, but in the end, we determined that we could play up on Agatha Harkness's old age, as she has been typically depicted in the comics for the majority of her appearances in the comic books, against the age of Clarion the Witch Boy, who's a young child. Both of them have cats, both of them are witches, both of them are pretty powerful, so it seemed like a pretty good matchup. Yeah, it's young versus old, cat versus cat, Agatha the witch versus Clarion the bitch. Uh, Whoa! Yeah, she's going to make him her bitch this episode. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I had to. Man, with the low-hanging fruit, you're right. Be better. <laughs> but to explain the methodology behind our duels, let's go to our sentient duel simulator, Alfred Jarvis 9000. AJ9K, tell our listeners how you go about determining a winner in our duel matchups. Yes, of course, sir. The way I determine a winner between the contestants is by running 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations using the character's statistics. A Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. In this case, I randomize the statistics along a normal distribution as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters are based on the official Marvel power grid from which the DC character's statistics are extrapolated. Additional stat categories are included such as range, damage potential, versatility and perception, 
in order to create a more detailed and accurate simulation. The results of the 1000 simulations provide a percentage of wins for each character. The contestant with the higher percentage is declared the victor as they have a higher probability to win any given battle. In an equitable pairing, neither character should win 100% of the matches. The comic book stories have shown that there's even a way for Batman to defeat Superman, so the confidence rate of my method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the source material. My mathematical simulations are without subjectivity or bias. Feats are not the sole consideration, nor are fan votes tabulated for determination of the winner. Thanks, AJ9K. Before we run the simulations, though, we'd like to break down each character's histories and abilities before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the 1,000 simulations would play out beat for beat. And I believe it's my turn to go first this episode with the Marvel character's backstory, so let me go ahead and tell you guys all about Agatha Harkness. Agatha Harkness's early life is largely unknown but she has claimed to be centuries old, living before the fall of Atlantis over 20,000 years ago. As a child of the ancient world, she began her practice in witchcraft early on and eventually became one of the Earth's most powerful sorceresses. Her earliest documented activities took place during the 1600s in an Eastern European country called Transia, near Wundagore Mountain, where she was part of a coven of witches that faced persecution during the height of the witch hunts across Europe at the time. By the late 17th century, Agatha had relocated to Salem, Massachusetts, where she established her own coven during the infamous Salem Witch Trials. Rather than hide from persecution this time, Agatha embraced it, believing that the trials were a way to strengthen the magical community by weeding out those who were not strong enough to survive. She sent some of her own followers to be judged and executed, believing that their sacrifice would make the remaining witches more resilient. During this time, Agatha encountered the time-displaced pyrokinetic mutant Firestar, whom people believed was a witch and tried without success to burn at the stake. Agatha admired Firestar's resilience in the face of adversity and her refusal to embrace violence as a solution. This influenced Agatha to abandon the idea of open warfare between witches and non-magical humans, and she led the surviving witches westward, establishing a hidden witch community called New Salem in the mountains of what would later become Colorado. Here, the witches were able to live in peace, far away from the fear and persecution from mankind. In New Salem, Agatha gave birth to her son, Nicholas Scratch, who would later become one of her most dangerous enemies. Over time, into the modern era, Agatha's ideals shifted, and she began to see the dangers of the coven's isolation. Believing that New Salem's retreat from the world would eventually lead to stagnation and decline, she left the community to rejoin the wider world. Her departure left a void in New Salem's leadership, and Nicholas Scratch took advantage of this, rising to power and fostering a deep resentment toward his mother for abandoning the community. After leaving New Salem, Agatha settled in New York, where she became the governess for Franklin Richards, the young son of Reed and Sue Storm of the Fantastic Four. Though the Richards family initially had no idea of Agatha's true nature, her powers were soon revealed when the Frightful Four villain team attempted to kidnap Franklin. Agatha used her magic to easily defeat the villains, including transforming her cat, Ebony, into a powerful panther to drive the intruders away. Her time with Franklin allowed her to bond with the Richards family, though her relationship with them would soon be tested by the return of her estranged son, Nicholas Scratch. Scratch, now the leader of New Salem, convinced the witches of that coven to abduct Agatha and Franklin, bringing them back to stand trial for their supposed crimes. The Fantastic Four pursued Agatha and Franklin to New Salem, where they clashed with Nicholas Scratch's seven children, known as Salem Seven, who had inherited immense magical powers from their father. Agatha and the Fantastic Four ultimately defeated Salem Seven, revealing the truth of Nicholas Scratch's evil machinations, and the people of New Salem banished Scratch to another dimension. Following her time with the Fantastic Four, Agatha shifted her focus to another powerful individual, Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch. Wanda, whose mutant abilities were intertwined with dark magical forces, desperately sought control over her powers, which had become increasingly unstable. Agatha saw the danger the Scarlet Witch posed, both to herself and to the world, and agreed to become her magical mentor. You can learn more in our Zatanna vs. Scarlet Witch dual episode. Under Agatha's guidance, the Scarlet Witch learned to tap into her abilities more effectively. Though Agatha kept the full truth of her powers, particularly their connection to the dark god of chaos, Cthan, hidden from her. 
Agatha's mentorship helped Scarlet Witch grow as a magic user, and her newfound control over her powers left her confident to marry her romantic partner Vision, an android, which led to the subsequent birth of their twin children. You can learn more about Vision in his duel against Marsha Manhunter. Wanda's children were later revealed to be magical constructs created from the fragments of the demon Mephisto's soul. When Mephisto reabsorbed the children, Agatha made the difficult decision to erase Wanda's memories of her kids, believing it to be the only way to spare her from the overwhelming grief. This act, though well-intentioned, planted the seeds for Wanda's eventual mental breakdown. Agatha continued to aid Wanda through her personal struggles, helping her face threats such as Immortus, who sought to manipulate Wanda's reality warping abilities for his own purposes. With Agatha's help, the Avengers were able to defeat Immortus, though Wanda's fragile mental state remained a constant concern. Years of repressed trauma eventually led to Wanda's breakdown, in part triggered by psychological manipulations by the villain Doctor Doom. In her grief and rage, Scarlet Witch destroyed the Avengers mansion, which led to the dissolution of the Avengers team. Wanda confronted Agatha, demanding to know the truth about her children. Not long after, Agatha was found dead in her home, her body seemingly desiccated. You can learn more about this in our Justice League vs. Avengers Team Duel episode. However, even death did not end Agatha's influence. She continued to appear in spectral form, forgiving Scarlet Witch and guiding her and others through the challenges they faced. Eventually, Agatha was brought back to life via the Goddess of Witchcraft, who was cleansed by Scarlet Witch during her journey through a mystical dimension known as the Witch's Road. Upon Agatha's resurrection, she returned to the magical fold, this time teaching new witches at Doctor Strange's new Magic Academy. It was there that an old coven member called Corrosion attempted to kill Agatha, but she was rescued by her new students, including the former Runaways member Nico Minoru, a teen sorceress. The mystical energies unleashed from the battle resulted in Agatha being de-aged from her elderly appearance into a young woman. After the Scarlet Witch destroyed a powerful book of chaos magic called the Darkhold, Agatha attempted to create a new Darkhold. Her plans were eventually thwarted by the Avengers, the consequences of which led to the Darkhold taking on the form of a young boy, whom Agatha fled with in an attempt to guide him. And that's Agatha's backstory. Powers-wise, Agatha Harkness is one of the most formidable witches on the planet, allowing her to cast all manner of spells. Her witchcraft abilities include precognition, possession, elemental manipulation, and transmutation. She can fly, teleport, cast illusions, and sense mystic occurrences. Agatha has the ability to summon mystical energies for offensive or defensive purposes, or manipulate these mystical energies to enhance, reflect, or negate their magical effects. With enough time, she can perform a magic ritual to achieve any number of spells. Her familiar, Ebony, is a magical cat capable of transforming into a powerful panther and regenerating from almost any wound. Agatha has extensive knowledge of witchcraft, gained over millennia, and has trained other powerful individuals in the use of their abilities. She's also terribly mysterious, I'll say, even inexplicably surviving death on several occasions. There you go. This old hag doesn't stand a chance. Wow. Way to discriminate on the basis of age there. Good job. I don't feel bad if it's a fictional character. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> also, she was de-aged. So, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Largely, they did that just so that the character would be consistent with how she appears in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, played by Katherine Hahn. Yeah, and I figured that. Yeah. Brand synergy. As I've typically known the character in the comics, though, yeah, she's pretty old. That's kind of what made her such a badass, though, because she's like so seemingly frail, almost looking kind of like Aunt May in the comics. But uh, she's supremely powerful. Well, not as powerful as Clarion. Let me get into his backstory. Now, Clarion Bleak, often referred to as Clarion the Witch Boy, was born in Limbo Town, an isolated and mysterious subterranean society hidden beneath New York City. Limbo Town was populated by Croatoans, who were the descendants of the lost Roanoke Colony, America's first permanent English settlement that later mysteriously vanished. To survive in the New World, the Croatoans had developed a deep connection to dark magic and necromancy over centuries. Every citizen in Limbo Town practiced witchcraft and had a draga, or an animal familiar, that aided them in their magical pursuits. Clarion's familiar was a cat named Tickle, who shared her master's rebellious and mischievous nature. 
From a young age, Clarion struggled with the strict rules and religious codes enforced by some missionary Judah, Limbo Town's leader. Judah and the other elders dictated how magic could be used, and they harshly discouraged any curiosity or questioning about the world beyond Limbo Town's borders. Clarion, however, was always drawn to the unknown and wanted to explore beyond his subterranean world. He secretly began studying darker and forbidden forms of magic, driven by his thirst for knowledge and freedom. His disobedience did not go unnoticed, however. Clarion's rebellious nature and his experiments with forbidden magic eventually caught the attention of the town elders, and one day Clarion found himself pursued by the Horrigal, terrifying entities created when Judah and other submissionaries merged with their familiars. Clarion fled Limbo Town with Tikal by his side, narrowly escaping the clutches of the Horrigal, and emerged in the subway tunnels beneath New York City, marking his first encounter with the world above which he'd later refer to as the Blue Rafters. In the subway tunnels, Clarion met Ebenezer Bade, another runaway from Limbo Town who had escaped years earlier. Bade took Clarion under his wing, showing him the many wonders and dangers of the surface world. It was a long, however, before Bade betrayed Clarion, with the intention to sell the boy into slavery. In response, Clarion and Tickle confronted Bade alongside a group of hive-minded children known as the Leviathan, whom Bade had been capturing for years, also to sell into slavery. With the Leviathan's help, Clarion put an end to Bade's schemes, and Bade was ultimately killed by the children he had exploited. Although the Leviathan offered Clarion a place among them, the witch boy declined as he wanted to continue his explorations of the world beyond. Clarion's travels led him to Manhattan, where he crossed paths with a man named Melmoth, who you can learn more about in our Frankenstein vs. Elsa Bloodstone duel episode. Melmoth offered Clarion food and shelter, while Clarion remained unaware that Melmoth was the Sheeta King, who had created the Witchmen and Witchwomen of Limbo Town centuries ago by breeding the women of the Roanoke colony with the Sheeta, a devolved human insectoid race from the future. Melmoth intended to use Clarion and a group of young delinquents known as the Deviant Ones to steal a massive subterranean drill to invade and plunder Limbo Town, taking back what he believed was his by right. When Clarion realized the extent of Melmoth's plans, he warned the Deviants about the Sheeta King's true motives, but chose not to confront Melmoth directly. Instead, Clarion decided to return to Limbo Town to protect his people from the impending invasion. Upon his return to Limbo Town, however, Clarion faced immediate hostility from the town's people, who accused him of blasphemy and believing he had abandoned their way of life, bringing back dangerous ideas back with him from the outside world. Clarion tried to warn them about Melmoth's invasion, but the townspeople refused to listen, and instead captured Clarion to burn him at the stake for his supposed crimes. Before they could carry out the execution, however, Melmoth and his army arrived, interrupting the proceedings. Clarion seized the opportunity to escape, and as he ran to ring the town bell in alarm, he ran into Judah, who was gravely wounded. Recognizing that his death was near, and that Limbo Town was in great danger, Judah passed on the title of Submissionary to Clarion. With this title came the ability to transform into a horror goal the same monstrous being that had once pursued Clarion when he fled Limbo Town. Merging with Tikal, Clarion assumed the form of a powerful Horrigal and fought off Melmoth's forces. He severely crippled the Sheeta King in battle, forcing Melmoth to retreat and saving Limbo Town from destruction. Despite his victory, Clarion rejected the idea of staying in Limbo Town as its leader, longing instead for freedom and adventure sans any responsibility and therefore departed for the surface world once again, only to emerge as the Sheeta attempted to overtake the planet. When the organization Shade and their agent Frankenstein attacked the Sheeta's time-traveling fortress known as the Castle Revolving, Clarion took advantage of the situation to take over the fortress and the Sheeta, becoming the new Sheeta King and taking the Sheeta into the past before he abandoned his crown. Upon returning to the present, Clarion allied himself with Contessa Erica Alexandria del Portenza, the former wife of Lex Luthor, who led a secret global organization known as the Agenda, which sought to cause chaos within the superhero community. Using his magical abilities, Clarion cast a spell that swapped the ages of teenage and adult heroes, 
turning young heroes into adults and their adult counterparts into teenagers. The spell created confusion and mistrust amongst both heroes and the general public, which delighted Clarion. For him, the chaos he caused was nothing more than a mischievous prank, another opportunity to push boundaries and test his powers, as well as have powerful playmates to occupy his time. However, Clarion's actions eventually backfired when he was confronted by a vengeful Lobo, who had been turned into a child by Clarion's spell. Upon his defeat, Clarion was forced to undo the spell and restore the heroes to their proper ages. Lonely, without his young playmates, Clarion traveled to the country occasionally offering heroes and villains alike increased power in exchange for portions of their souls. While in Gotham City, a fellow Limbo Town exile kidnapped Tikal, along with other witches' familiars, in order to conjure an apocalyptic entity known as the Judgment Beast. But with the help of Tim Drake, Robin, Clarion was able to rescue Tikal and return the familiars back to their rightful owners. You can learn more about Tim Drake in his duel against the Winter Soldier. In post-Flashpoint continuity, Clarion encountered several mystical figures in New York and became involved with a magical coven led by Piper, who sought to help him understand and control his powers. During this time, Clarion faced a mysterious villain named Cole, who had introduced a form of dangerous, addictive technology onto the streets. Clarion, always seeking new ways to strengthen himself, ingested this future technology to boost his powers and confront Cole. Their battle ended with Clarion easily defeating his foe by stealing his techno magic, further augmenting his own abilities. Later, Clarion ascended to new heights as a powerful Lord of Chaos, aligning himself with Pariah's Dark Army in order to re-establish DC's original multiverse. And that's his backstory so far. Powers-wise, as a Croatoan warlock, Clarion is a natural prodigy of the dark arts and the occult, with powers sourced from his bond with his magical cat familiar, Tikal, with whom Clarion has a psychic link. These powers include telekinesis, transmutation, teleportation, energy absorption and manipulation, telepathy, divination, and spellcasting. He's also quite durable as long as he's near Tikal. If Tikal is injured, Clarion's power is greatly reduced. That's Clarion. So what's interesting there is that for the most part, Agatha Harkness has been a supporting character among the larger Marvel magic scene. She's had her own titles occasionally, but they haven't lasted very long. But according to your backstory for Clarion, it seems like he's a long running character with his own titles. I'm interested in like who created the character and when did his stories really start taking place? Well, Jack Kirby created the character. He was originally a villain for Jason Blood, I believe. Uh, he appeared in the, the Demon comics, who's also a, a creation of Jack Kirby's. Uh, he's only had a few of his own miniseries, though. He had one that was written by Grant Morrison. He also had a recent one, but yeah, not not too many. OK, so much of his backstory was kind of detailed in the Edric and the Demon comic books. Well, his own comics, I would say, like Seven Soldiers of Victory written by Grant Morrison. Oh, I see. Okay. Grant Morrison kind of rewrote Clarion's origin story. And Jack Kirby's original version for the character, he was from Witch World, and I think that was later retconned to Beyond Country. It was another dimension entirely. But Grant Morrison was the one who kind of established him as being a descendant of the Roanoke colony, which is a real colony and a real mystery in the U.S. Croatoa, yeah, that is a weird mystery. Definitely a spooky one, just in time for this season. In a world where fantasies collide and heroes clash, one podcast network rises above the rest. Prepare yourself for the ultimate showdowns in comic books, video games, movies, and anime. The Dynamite Podcast Network presents Console Combat, where video game legends brawl every Monday. Dynamic Duel, where comic book titans smash every Tuesday. Max Destruction, where TV and action heroes battle every Wednesday and Sendro World, where anime champions clash every Thursday. Join us as we speculate on the matches and, armed with the power of mathematical simulations, discover who will emerge victorious. Visit dynamicpodcast.com where we settle the debate and settle the score. Now that we got their histories and abilities out of the way, we're going to speculate on how one of the 1,000 simulated matches will go. The winners determined by simulations, not the speculation, but it's fun to imagine how the fight could play out. AJ and IK, what are the rules of our speculation? 
Well, I should say there are no rules, other than the characters have no prior knowledge of the other going into the fight. All they are aware of starting out is that the other character is a threat that needs to be eliminated. For the speculation, the contestants will begin approximately 50 meters apart in a nondescript environment that will have no bearing on the match itself, as no environmental statistics are considered in my simulations. The contestants must earn victory on their own merit. All right, then, let's get into it. Clarion the Witch Boy and Agatha Harkness meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? You know what? I think Clarion will go first uh, by aging Agatha up to her old lady form. If she isn't there already, then he's going to let Agatha go, you know, citing age before beauty. All right. OK, um, that's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I think Agatha will probably smirk at what just happened. You know, she's used to being an old lady anyway. Um, her cat Ebony is going to hiss at Clarion and Agatha is going to give the little brat what's coming to him. She's going to use her magic to erect a dead tree behind Clarion and she's going to animate the tree so that it bends Clarion over its trunk and then gives the child a swift paddle on his behind. <laughs> okay, actually, once the tree touches Clarion, uh, it's going to burst into green flame and then like quickly dissolve into ash, except for like one small black branch that's shaped like a slingshot that Clarion's gonna pick up and use it to magically sling green fireballs at Agatha while just laughing his head off. Well, before the fireballs can reach her, Agatha is gonna telekinetically yank Clarion's slingshot toward her, transforming it into a broom. Okay, and she's gonna use that broom to just swat away the green fireballs with little to no effort. And then she's gonna hop on the broom and fly into the night sky with her cat. Um, and then from the air, she's going to start throwing down purple lightning magic bolts at Clarion. Ah, but Agatha can't hit what she can't see because, you know, as she was flying into the air, Clarion summoned a plague of locusts that's going to fill the environment around them just with darkness, blotting out the stars and the moon and knocking Agatha out of the sky. Okay, but Agatha is going to dodge these locusts and... Uh, she's going to fly around and summon a massive whirlwind that's going to dispel this locust plague by sucking all the bugs out of the sky and away from the battlefield. And now that the moon is visible again, Agatha is going to wave her hand over it, which is going to turn the moon blood red in color. Okay, And as it shines its moonlight onto Clarion, blood is just going to start pouring from his eyes and his mouth and nose and his ears, just like all the holes. And uh, he's going <laughs> to fall down to his knees in pain. That's wild. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to say Clarion falls to his knees because he's laughing so hard. And <laughs> while he's laughing, he's going to use his own blood to draw these intricate runes on the ground that stop the blood moon curse. And from the earth that his blood was spilled on, he conjures this gargoyle that rises from the ground and it's gonna fly after Agatha and just slash her with its claws. Okay, but as the gargoyle approaches Agatha, as she's in the air, her black cat Ebony is gonna leap off the broomstick and in midair transform into a demonic werecat creature, like an evil panther on steroids, kinda. And with a loud roar, Ebony's gonna tackle the gargoyle down to the ground and just shatter it into small pebbles and sand and stuff like that. Yeah. And then she's gonna take a shit on the gargoyle. What? Because it's like it was kitty litter and uh, Ebony turns back into a cat. <laughs> Dude, okay. Uh, well, as Ebony was taking the time to take a shit, <laughs> Clarion, he's going to sick his orange tabby cat familiar Tickle on Ebony's panther form. But Tickle is going to be in the form of this giant monstrous lion. And the two cats are going to scream and claw with just tufts of fur flying everywhere. Basically, it's the worst cat fight you could possibly imagine. And uh, it's going to end, though, with Ebony's neck snapped in Tickle's jaws because no way a panther is defeating a lion. D no, 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 no. Ebony, the cat, has gone up against Mephisto himself and lived to tell the tale, okay? What? The cat was straight up turned inside out by Mephisto and it still came back like nothing had happened because Ebony has like the most insane magical healing factor ever. And also, I'm gonna say that Agatha puts a binding hex on Tikal to prevent it from fighting back against Ebony. So Ebony's just mopping the floor with Tikal and making Tikal look like a busted ass hairless lion by this <laughs> point. 
And Clarion's magic is weakened because Tikal is weakened. And also, I, I gotta say, everyone knows any witch worth their salt has a black cat, not an orange one, so. Yeah, all the basic bitch witches have black cats. <laughs> but with Tikal trapped, you know, I'm not gonna lie, Clarion, he's pretty emotionally immature. So seeing his cat trapped in that spell is probably going to cause him to throw a screaming fit. And Clarion's cries are going to rattle both Agatha and Ebony, making them feel like their heads are going to explode. So while they're stunned, Clarion's going to teleport over to Tikal and merge with him, transforming into a massive Horrigal. What, what's a Horrigal? Again, what do they look like? Uh, it, uh, they all look different, but Clarion's version looks like a four-armed werecat with like a second face on his forehead. It, it's essentially like Clarion's ultimate form. And mm. as a horror goal, you know, before Agatha and Ebony can even react, their entrails are already strewn all over the battlefield because the horror goal ripped them both to shreds match over. Wow. Um, well, okay. Agatha and Ebony are all shredded and dead, uh, except that they're not. In fact, Agatha is over off to the side of the battlefield sipping tea with Ebony in her lap. Because what Clarion thought he saw, that was just an illusion that Agatha had cast as a distraction. And and suddenly, Clarion's horrible form just drops dead. Because what he didn't realize was that this match was already over the moment that Ebony used that destroyed blood gargoyle as a litter box. Okay? Because her poo cast a poisonous curse that seeped into Clarion's blood, right? And it just tainted him with this, like, slow death. And since Clarion merged with Tikal, they're both dead. That's your finishing move? Yeah, dude, cat poop's dangerous, all right? Like, it has parasites in it and shit that can give you toxoplasmosis, okay? It's dangerous enough on its own. Like, it can give you schizophrenia and shit. So imagine how dangerous a demon panther's poop is. Just makes sense. Is that true? Like, yeah, I record this podcast in my basement, not too far (laughs) away from my cat's litter box. Well, I mean, that explains why you're a DC fan then. It's the neurosis. Okay. (laughs) You know what? I'm calling cat shit on all of this. No way Clarion gets taken out by cat poop. In reality, Agatha and Ebony are already dead. The whole, oh, it's just an illusion thing. That didn't happen. Well, we could leave the match there either Agatha and Ebony get shredded by Clarion's horrible form, or that's just an illusion and Clarion dies from being poisoned with a curse. A poop curse. The worst kind. We'll go ahead and leave it there and put the character stats into our simulator, run the simulations, and come back with a winner. AJ9K, hit it! Inputting data, running calculations, processing results, simulations complete. All right, Clarion the Witch Boy versus Agatha Harkness. As I suspected, the characters were fairly close stat-wise. And when one character did come out on top, it wasn't by much. Yeah, the characters are both a little bit vague in their magical abilities, as witches and wizards tend to be. You know, they can almost do anything in a sense. But these two characters were unique in that they had some similarities around things like fighting skill that kind of set them apart. You know, they're both not physical fighters at all. Yeah, and when it came to things like movement speed, strength, damage level, range, perception, versatility, they were evenly matched. Yeah, we said Agatha did come out a little bit ahead when it came to intellect, just because Agatha's lived for millennia, and she's not as naive as Clarion is. Yeah, Clarion is a literal child. A smart child, but a child. Yeah, he's not wise like Agatha is. Clarion, however, came out far ahead when it came to durability, because the dude has been slapped by heavy hitters like Edric and the Demon and Lobo. Yeah, and Mary Marvel, all kinds of heavy hitters. But we also said that Agatha got the edge when it came to evasiveness, simply because there's a lot more instances of her avoiding damage than Clarion. Yeah, through her magic shields and illusion casting and things like that. She has to avoid damage because she's just not as durable. She will literally break a hit. Exactly. (laughs) So with all that in mind, Jonathan, who do you think is coming out on top in this match? I think Clarion, uh, just because... There's no young boy that's going to be taken out by an old woman. It's just not a thing that happens. And so far, our followers on Instagram agree with me. 
I put up the poll a little late, but so far, 55% of the poll takers agree with me. Well, that just makes me think that we have a lot of younger poll takers that just don't know any better. Actually, that makes me feel like a lot of those who voted are children of the 90s, considering that Clarion featured in a prominent episode of Batman the Animated Series back in the day. That's true, but Agatha Harkness has her own fucking series. How crazy is that? Well, people must not like it because they're not voting for her. Whatever. Let's go ahead and see who won. AG9K, the results, please. Here you are, sir. Okay, uh, the winner between Clarion the Witch Boy and Agatha Harkness is Agatha Harkness. No! That's right. She made Clarion the Witch Boy her little bitch boy by beating him (laughs) in 515 matches out of the 1,000 total battles. Clarion only won 485. So Agatha's win percentage is 51.5%. And Clarion's is 48.5%. That is really close. Like, I don't think Agatha made Clarion her bitch. She did, though, because she won. So Clarion can cry about it. He probably will, honestly, not going to lie. But now you have to deal with that. So congratulations. (laughs) I will deal with it by not dealing with it and more than likely laughing at the kid. (laughs) Because that's what happens when you mess with Marvel and old ladies and think that you could beat them. Old ladies can sometimes be pretty badass, as Agatha Harkness has shown here today. I was going to say that young Puritan boys could also be badass, but I don't think that's true. (laughs) Well, I guess that does it for this duel. AJ9K, help close us out. Thanks for listening to Dynamic Duel. Visit the show's website at dynamicduel.com and follow us on Instagram at Dynamic Duel Podcast. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash dynamic duel and joining a tier that works for you or by rating and reviewing Dynamic Duel on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser or on our website. Don't forget to listen to the other shows in the Dynamite Podcast Network, including Max Destruction, Senjo World and Console Combat. Our next episode is going to be another duel episode. Guys, you remember how last year we surprised you with a team duel that was the deceased versus the Marvel zombies? We're going to surprise you guys again with another team duel, and we think you'll be excited by it. And hey, if you've made it this far in the episode, we'll let you know what the surprise is now. Creature Commandos versus Legion of Monsters, baby. That's right. We're pitting like classic Halloween creatures against each other next week and lead up to the Halloween holiday. So look forward to that. But that does it for this episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Dustin Belcom, Mickey Matanguian, Brandon Estergaard, Nathaniel Wagner, Levi Yaton, Austin Wasilowski, AJ Dunkerley, Scott Camacho, Gil Camacho, Adam Spees, Andrew Schunk, Dean Molesky, Devin Davis, Joseph Kirsting, and Josh Liner for helping make this podcast possible. We'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away! True believers? If she weighs as much as a duck, then she's made of wood, and therefore a witch.